So hi everyone, welcome to the soil health session of the 2022 Indiana Small Farm Conference. Um, if you have not been in Zoom for a while or ever, um, today we are asking that you mute yourself during the presentation. Um, at the question and answer time at the end, if you would like to ask a question and turn on your microphone, you can go to the bottom of your screen and there is something called reactions that has a smiley face with a plus sign. If you click on that, there's an option to raise your hand and myself or our other moderator will help facilitate that. Um, or the other option is to place your comments or questions in the chat box. So as well, if you hover on the bottom and you don't currently see the chat, there's a little word bubble that says chat that will pop up and then you can talk to all of us. Um, so my name is Laura Ingwell and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Entomology here at Purdue. Um, I am an extension specialist for pest insect pest management in horticultural crops. And I have the honor and privilege to work with our small farm conference team and support small farmers, diversified farmers throughout the state with their pest management needs. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I have a couple slides here I'm gonna share at the beginning and then I'm going to let my co-moderator, Kevin Allison from Marion County Soil and Water Conservation District introduce our speaker. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen for a moment. Okay, so you all have found your way here to the session. Um, the next thing I want to do is say thank you so much to our sponsors. We could not put on this conference without their help. Um, and a lot of you have been very dedicated in, in sponsoring this conference for many years. Um, the conference, this session is being recorded today, and there is also live streamed closed captioning available. So if you would like to view that closed captioning, again, hover around your screen and you'll see the live streaming closed captioning and you hit request. And you will be able to have that live transcription um, provided up on your screen. So that's um, available at the individual level. Um, Okay. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Kevin Allison. I hope I didn't forget anything. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kevin Allison with the Marion County Soil and Water Conservation District in Indianapolis. Um, I'm excited to be here introducing Jesse Frost at the Small Farms Conference. Um, a special thanks to the Marion County SWCD and to the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service for supporting this session. Um, part of my job is to work with the NRCS on um, enhancing their support for small scale agriculture and um, yeah, just excited to see what's happening there and um, just their continued support. So I'd encourage growers to reach out to your SWCDs and the NRCS just to, to, as we'd love to work with you. Um, the USDA is an equal opportunity provider, employer and lender. Um, Jesse Frost and his family grow at Rough Draft Farmstead in Kentucky. Um, he's also the host of the No-Till Market Garden podcast and the author of the Living Soil Handbook, the No-Till Grower's Guide to Ecological Market Gardening. Great book. Um, they're both incredible resources that you can find more about at notillgrowers.com. Um, I'm sure I can speak for anyone that's engaged with this content and that all the work you do is very much appreciated um, in sharing your experiences and giving a forum um, to others to do the same. So we're glad you're here to share with Indiana Growers, Jesse, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you to Laura and everybody at Indiana Small Farm. Uh, very excited to be here today. I'm going to real quick share my screen. Um, let's see, let's get all this organized. There we go. Uh, and I'm going to... Okay. Can everybody see that? Does that look good, Kevin and Laura? Yes. Looks good. Yes. Awesome. All right. Yeah. So this is going to be the topic of conversation today. Uh, maintaining living soil in a commercial market garden. Um, let me see if I can move some of the Zoom stuff around. The uh, So I am the author of the Living Soil Handbook. That is, um, you know, the the way that I designed this book was not just here's how things work on my farm. And so go try and emulate that wherever you are. 
but rather this is how soil works. And here are some ideas for how to approach the different scenarios, the different contexts. So that's kind of how I'm going to approach the conversation today. Um, throughout, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. That's going to be the best way for us to address them at the end. So um, I'm going to leave a fairly substantial amount of time to address questions at the end. If anything comes up uh, that you have questions about, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, and then we will make sure to try and get to as many of those as we can. This book is available through notillgrowers.com. That's the best place to buy it. That supports our work. Uh, and if that sale directly through notillgrowers.com, that money goes into making more free content. Our entire design at notillgrowers.com is to make as much content free and available as humanly possible. So um, it does take funds to do that, but we try and give everything away. So um, book is kind of a fundraiser. Think of it that way. And the, as Kevin mentioned, I am the host of the No-Till Market Garden podcast. This is uh, going to be a great complimentary resource like the book to everything we talk about today. Uh, this is conversations with people who were doing it on the ground level. And so from all over the world and every, I try to, you know, I, hope, I like to think that every conversation has uh, some amount of value, no matter where you're farming and no matter what you farm. So um, hopefully there will be some good value in there for you to use as a secondary resource. A little bit about myself. Uh, this is, uh, I like Kevin said, I'm a farmer at Rough Draft Farmstead. I farm with my wife here and we're raising some local fauna. They are uh, often eating, not always eating as much in the garden as we want them to, but definitely destroying some things. Um, we are this, we just moved to this new property. You're actually going to see a glimpse of the old property later, but the new prop, this is our new property. We moved here in December of 2020. And this was, uh, this would have been June of 2021 that this was shot. So we've opened up more space. We've finished this tunnel here since then and, and several other things, but this is about um, in total. Now we're at about an acre in production. Uh, we do permanent beds and we can talk about that a little bit later. Uh, they're four foot wide, and we do a lot of things like living pathways, which you'll see coming up shortly um, in between the beds. And there's reasons for that, but we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into to issues of context. Um, so in order to understand you know, living soil, we kind of need to understand where the food comes from, right? Uh, everything needs food. This is where the food comes from is through plants. So we're going to talk about um, this. This is the... But we're not going to, this is what we're going to talk about. Well, we're not going to talk about it that way. We're going to talk about it like this, because this is not that complicated, right? This is just the formula for photosynthesis, carbon dioxide plus water mixed with sunlight equals glucose plus oxygen. That's, that's the formula for photosynthesis. But when you talk about it like this, everybody has the context, right? You can think of the soil like a battery. Um, that gives everybody instant context into some of the denser soil, because as farmers, I think it's really important that we understand how photosynthesis works and how plants feed the soil. But I don't necessarily think we all have to understand every nuance to it and all the scientific details. It's good for us as growers to understand that because that's what we do that's our livelihood. Um, but it's easier for me using these analogies uh, to express some of these complex ideas. So we're going to start with start with thinking of the soil like a battery that it has its has its solar panels, right? Um, leaves anywhere on the plant that is green, and many times not green, uh, anywhere there's chlorophyll. So basically anything but stems um, have the potential to photosynthesize. And that means that's going to be an important factor later on when we're talking about making sure your plants are getting enough sunlight. So the, um, the you know, solar battery, like all batteries, it has also has infrastructure. So that would be like roots and stems. These are the transportation elements of a plant of our battery. They move nutrients from the soil uh, to the plant and from the plant down to the soil. Uh, water, all of the things that plants need move through these, this infrastructure and um, then you have the battery itself, but the battery itself isn't just the ground up rock. In some ways, the, the you know, the rock material that we call soil, um, in some ways, that's more like the casing. The battery is actually the living stuff, the fungi, the uh, bacteria, the, you know, microfauna like this, in this case, a microarthropod. Um, those are the things that are actually where the energy goes, what the energy turns into, right? Um, but also every living organism on the planet is part of the soil battery. 
everything to some extent or another relies on photosynthesis for its livelihood. Even things that up in the far north eat something that eats kelp, right? Um, so in some way, shape, or form, everything on the planet is dependent on this amazing biological process. Um, arguably the most important chemical process on the planet. So let's follow some energy. Um, you know, you have our solar panels. Solar panels collect sunlight, uh, mix it with carbon dioxide and uh, water, and they create glucose. They push that down into the roots to feed bacteria and fungi and, uh, and protozoa and uh, all sorts of good archaea, that sort of stuff. And then larger organisms like that Marker arthropod we saw, they consume those and they release uh, nutrients into the soil for the plant, but they also become food for other organisms, such as a earthworm. And that earthworm maybe becomes food for something else like this hen here. And then that hen lays an egg and suddenly what started out is carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight is now a micro, 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 micro sliver of an egg. And then that becomes part of us when we consume it. So that is where, you know, the energy enters the system. Uh, it becomes a part of us and we are part of the solar battle battery, which I think is a really important part in here. And I often put a slide in here just talking about how uh, we tend to think of carbon and uh, soil organic matter as something that um, is kind of indefinite. We can put a ton of soil organic matter into the soil and that's true, but there is a point at which the soil gets saturated enough with soil organic matter that it's actually puts that energy into other things. So it puts the solar energy into things like, um, uh, you know, uh, more worms, more bugs, more birds, more things. So uh, for instance, when America was colonized, the Native Americans had really amazing, especially out there in California, uh, in particular, where we have a lot of really great accounts of what that land looked like. Uh, when, you know, colonists showed up there, um, they found millions and millions of birds and millions of, of you know, just the, enough to block out the sun and bugs and fish and just the world was teeming with life, um, brimming with it. And, uh, you know, the biggest factor there wasn't that the soil was, you know, 20 or 30% or 40% soil organic matter. It was eight to 10, maybe 12 in some places. But it, once it fills up, it starts pouring that energy into other life. And that's a really important factor. We know we're succeeding in our farming when we see a lot of biodiversity around, because that means the soil is getting the carbon it needs enough to share it. So let's kind of just, just get a little bit, dissect this, this, this idea of photosynthesis just a little, little bit more, revisit some of the things I know that most of us have forgotten since high school. Um, if the soil battery is, you know, if the soil is a battery, photosynthesis is how we charge it. We have to kind of understand this process. So um, let's just go through it really quickly. The water, water enters the scene through the roots. Um, it is drawn up into the up into the roots through a sort of negative pressure system, which is really fascinating that, that the plant releases um, some water out of the stoma, which we, the stomata we'll see in a minute. Um, and that basically pulls water. It's almost like a siphon up through into the plant and uh, into really industrious little cells called chloroplasts. Um, they are create chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is what the pigment, that the color uh, of the plant that draws in sunlight in the form of photons. So you have water in the picture, you have sunlight coming into the picture. Um, sunlight enters the plant through those chlorophyll and it begins to split the water molecules uh, in one of the coolest processes on the planet. It literally, the plants are using sunlight to split hydrogen uh, from water, uh, from oxygen molecules releasing the oxygen into the air for us to breathe and retaining the hydrogen to carry around a little energy for it in the plant. Um, this is all going to be kind of important because we are going to talk a little bit about carbon dioxide, but you don't have to memorize all of this stuff. This is just kind of a base, you know, understanding of how photosynthesis works. So, um, so sunlight comes in, splits the water molecules, it releases that oxygen for us to breathe. Um, and then it mixes that, those, that hydrogen and that little bit of energy uh, with carbon dioxide. And that's where we get, uh, and that actually happens because the plant is able to diffuse uh, carbon dioxide through the bottom of the leaves in those little things called stomata. They are located on the bottom of the leaves, and that is kind of important to know that the carbon dioxide, the, the, the things that pull in the carbon dioxide are located on the bottoms of the leaves. 
And that's important to know because there are these little, there are these little holes uh, called stomata. Um, they diffuse in nutrients and carbon dioxide and, and they can take in water and other things. Um, but they're located on the bottom side of the leaf because that's where the carbon dioxide is coming from. The, pro the main source of carbon dioxide is coming out of the soil. And so carbon dioxide goes in, in the form of glucose. So when you mix that hydrogen, the sunlight and everything together with the carbon, um, with the carbon dioxide, you get glucose essentially, which is like a, a building block of all life. It's no big deal. Um, but then that is pushed into the soil. Uh, glucose is used to form plant leaves and, uh, you know, uh, it's also mixed in what we call root exudates. Uh, these can be really fascinating little concoctions. The plant can mix up a bunch of different forms of exudates to feed the soil, to adjust the soil pH, um, to call in certain uh, microorganisms to protect itself from other plants, like a lelopathy, that is a form of root exudate. Um, but you can also kind of think of glucose like a Lego. They are the building blocks of all life. You can build so much out of a molecule of glucose and uh, you can basically build everything, everything that's living. Um, and those are, so this is kind of the basic setup. This is, this is actually out of the book. My wife illustrated this. Um, these are the basic factors, right? Carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. Those are the basic factors, but these are kind of all the factors involved with soda photosynthesis or some of them, you know, you have nutrients are important. What new, you know, there are, there are, uh, some molecules embedded in this process or nutrients embedded in this process that are a requirement for photosynthesis. Uh, microbes, air temperature, like photosynthesis management of it is kind of complicated. So we're, we're going to strip that down um, just a little bit to these things. But I always like to say that, you know, you, you, if you ask a biologist how what is photosynthesis, they will say water, sunlight, carbon dioxide uh, creates glucose in the plant um, or something maybe more elegant than that. But the, the uh, reality is, you know, that that's, that's a very oversimplification of the process that requires a lot of different factors, but a process that we can be involved with quite a lot. Um, so these are the ones that we're going to kind of focus on. These are the ones that we as growers, as farmers get to manage some. Um, you can manage some of the other ones as well, but these I feel like we, we get a little bit more control over or can have more of an impact on. Um, so let's talk about water. And just a little bit about water. We, we kind of take water for granted as this thing that we need clearly, but you know, how does it work? Um, water enables the enzymatic activities of microbes. So that means that water allows in uh, microbes to create the enzymes, the little keys that they need to break out nutrients from enzymes are just like little catalysts or little keys. And they use those enzymes to break out nutrients to, to absorb nutrients from uh, rock material or parent material, you know, the soil, uh, soil particles. And so water enables them to do that. It moderates soil and plant temperatures, water does. So in the summer, uh, we grow a lot of lettuce. And um, I know that you all probably don't have temperatures that are that wildly different from us down here in Kentucky. But the um, you know, the, we use water all the time in the middle of the summer, we'll use it to cool down our summer lettuce. And we do it multiple times a day, just spritz our lettuce, just cools it down and it allows the plant to keep growing and photosynthesizing because lettuce likes to bolt in the summer, but it doesn't like to grow, even if it's not bolting in really high temperatures. So we use it to cool down the plant and cool down the soil. Um, water is essential for photosynthesis, obviously, but it is also in excess, it can shut down photosynthesis. So remember how I said water uh, pulls is pulled up into the plant through that negative pressure system that that sort of uh, that that releasing of uh, water through the the uh, stomata. Well, if it's too if it's the plants are too saturated, it shuts down those stoma. So your stomata your stomata apple your stomata aperture actually shuts and it basically um, it, it nearly closes. So that means that you're not photosynthesizing. So it can be perfectly nice outside. You can have all the carbon dioxide you need, but too much water can actually stop the process. Um, and there are a lot of other factors with why you don't want, uh, you know, too much water at your roots. And we will actually touch on those as we go through. Um, and it enables water enables uh, nutrient and microbe transportation. This is just how things get around. Um, and it does a million other things. It, you know, when looking for life on other planets, scientists literally look for water. So considerations for good water stewardship, um, a good source, a well, pond, rainwater, maybe a mixture of all three. Um, you know, that the quality of your water will have an impact on your soil life and on the quality of your plants, uh, on the pH of your soil, all of the things. Um, 
It can also have, uh, you know, uh, health concerns if it, if it's, uh, contaminated. So all of those things are really important. Um, good drainage in your soil. I know that you all are probably dealing with a lot of what we deal with down here in Kentucky, which is a lot of clay. Uh, we good drainage, understanding your drainage is really important. A simple drainage test is to dig a hole, fill that hole with water one time, let that water drain out, then fill it again, the same, you know, right immediately after. Um, and if that water does not completely drain out in 24 hours, then you have poor drainage and that has to be addressed. Um, that poor drainage can come from compaction or other means, but we'll talk a little bit about sort of addressing compaction here in a little bit. Uh, but that is something to, you know, take into consideration as your, your drainage is really important because if it doesn't drain, uh, you know, you're going to have a buildup of anaerobic organisms that will, uh, create toxic gases, um, that will effectively, t you know, kill your plants or they can be pathogenic to your plants. Um, and you're, like I said, your plants need to be able to, your roots need to be able to breathe and they can't be too overly saturated. Um, you need consistent irrigation. So um, sometimes with irrigation, so people think get the soil wet, let it get wet and then kind of, you know, conserve a little bit. And that's good. You should conserve as much as you can, um, generally speaking. But I think uh, you need good, consistent irrigation. The soil has to stay wet consistently to keep your microbial populations in the, happy and the plants happy. Um, and good soil coverage helps with that. So I'm talking about mulches and we, and we will discuss those in a little while. So that's part of good stewardship, water stewardship, um, and employing practices that increase soil organic matter. That last one seems really obvious, but is actually probably not as obvious for some people. Um, because things like bare fallow, for instance, is not increasing soil organic matter, right? That, that, that's directly kind of doing the opposite. It's allowing the soil um, to just respire that carbon dioxide and not have anything to pull it back in. Um, and soil organic matter is important because it acts a little bit like a sieve. Uh, so, you know, you see all these little aggregates, soil organic matter is a lot of, you know, a lot of aggregated carbon, uh, carbon that's kind of wrapped in soil particles by, by microbes that kind of put the sticky stuff around it. But this is like a close up of a sieve where you have water that kind of sticks in between those aggregates. Right. But also, interestingly, with soil organic matter and somewhat paradoxically, it allows water to pass through. Oops. Um, it allows water to pass through. Right. If you're just like a like you were straining a soup, um, it allows water to pass through. But then when the water's through, when it's passed, it'll it keeps some of that there. So you can, that's that's the easiest analogy for me to explain how soil organic matter and why it's important and how it works. Um, let's talk about sunlight. So. Uh, Sunlight is obviously the power source for photosynthesis. Um, too little causes legginess. We've all seen this in plants that are growing under our deck or in a, um, you know, uh, in in a germination chamber. Maybe you've grown uh, something undercover or in a dark place, and it's gotten really leggy. It's gotten grown a really long white stem because it's reaching for for sunlight. So that means that it has the water it needs and it has the temperatures it needs and it has the carbon dioxide it needs but it lacks the sunlight so it's reaching for sunlight and obviously that can have um it can slow your photosynthesis down clearly but it also uh can have if you get even just a little bit of legginess that can have effects in the in the field of crops laying on the ground making them more difficult to harvest making them more susceptible to disease um and two and tenths of sunlight can scorch up plants um can scorch up plant cells so there's not really anything, any such thing as too much sunlight. Like plants can take on a lot of sunlight. You can think about some of those places in the far north uh, where they can grow for 24 hours straight in a row, um, you know, where they have no, uh, like where they, they don't have a sunset, um, where it just stays light for 24 hours. Plants will grow that whole time, right? There's no excess sunlight there. Uh, but the problem is when you have too intense of sunlight to, that can scorch up your plant cells, meaning that it's not diffuse enough, it's just too direct. Because nothing, none of the plants that we grow uh, evolved in a situation where they're just a lettuce sitting out in a bare field, right? They grew in these really in diverse environments where sun is being diffused, ref, you know, uh, reflected off of um, a lot of different stuff around it. So, um, you know, I think, We'll talk about this in a second, but the, you know, any part of the plant um, that's green, as I mentioned, is able to photosynthesize. So it's a way of getting that light down to every part of the plant. And many C3 plants 
uh, better utilize sunlight when it's diffused. So mostly what we're talking about in vegetable production are what are called C3 plants. There are C4 plants like corn, um, sorghum. Those are plants that are, that are more able to take that direct sunlight. Uh, I'm not really going to talk a lot about those. Those are, you know, uh, C4 plants are pretty well understood for the people that grow them, but C3 plants are a little bit more complex, uh, because they have different light requirements and they also, um, have a different pathway for managing excessive, uh, intense sunlight or intense heat. Um, so considerations for sunlight management though, um, tunnels, tunnels, uh, actually do a really good job of diffusing the light. So it hits the plastic and it diffuses that way, it hits all this metal that you can see, and it diffuses that way. Um, that bounces it down all the way to the bottom, you know, to the green that's on these, on the bottoms of these romains that you can see that I've harvested. Um, you know, hoops and covers, uh, shade plastic, uh, shade plastic, uh, like this plastic here, uh, row covers. So an example of that is like shade cloth, uh, in the middle of the summertime, like I said, we grow a lot of summer lettuce. And one of the things that we'll do is we'll throw shade cloth over top of it for the first two weeks to get it to establish, um, during really hot spells. And what that, that slows down growth just a little bit, but it does diffuse that light a little bit as well. So there's a benefit there, but it does, it does slow things down, but it also just keeps them cool. Um, same with tunnels. Tunnels actually also keep, uh, keep plants cool. That adds just a small percentage of shade, which helps for growing more tender crops. Um, and then there is our natural shading, uh, you know, uh, trees and those sorts of things. There's also diffuse light. Interplanting is another example of that. So like, um, you know, this would be an example of natural shading or light diffusion through interplanting. I'm doing a talk on Monday about interplanting, but this is one where you have tomatoes um, with beets underplanted right here. These cherry tomatoes did wonderfully, but they bounce, you know, that light is bouncing off all of these leaves and it's getting down to these, all these beet, you know, this lower beet leaves and it's not as intense. So um, let's talk about carbon dioxide. And if you have, like I said, if you have any questions about this as we go along, you can put them in the chat uh, or you can write them down and see if I address them later. But don't hesitate because I'll, I will try and leave as much time as I can for, um, for to address that in the, uh, at the end. So carbon dioxide, so this one seems like, um, this one's a little bit more convoluted because it doesn't seem like something that we can manage super well, uh, but we can. And um, because we have a lot of control over the quality of our soil, how it, how it, how well it respires, um, you, you know, we can incur, do things that encourage the microbial populations and the, the microbial biomass in our soil. Um, so carbon dioxide highest concentrations in the atmosphere are right around the soil. So that is, that's where we're getting the bulk of our carbon is coming out of the soil because soil organisms are eating the you know, uh, the root exudates and they're eating themselves and they're eating each other and they're eating. Uh, and then like us, when we eat a sandwich, a vast majority of that sandwich or a large percentage of that sandwich comes out in the form of carbon dioxide. Um, a lot of what we put in the soil comes out of the soil in the form of carbon dioxide and, um, increasing CO2 around the plant can sometimes equate to, to more biomass and better yields, but not necessarily more soil organic matter. One of the limiting factors for farmers is carbon dioxide um, because you have to have a really healthy population of, of soil organisms and um, soil organic matter to really have a robust amount of CO2 coming out of your soil to go back into your plants so they can turn it into more glucose. Um, but, and so some people do some supplementation, um, but some evidence that CO, you know, increasing CO2 decreases the protein and other nutrients. I'm not necessarily going to recommend um, supplementing your CO2, but I think it's good to understand how that affects your plants when you have more CO2. Um, and when you increase your CO2 respiration from your soil. So, um, you know, like for instance, this, this is a meta analysis, um, that did, you know, did, looked at, uh, over a thousand studies and saw that increasing CO2, let me move my little zoom thing here. Um, it increased the concentrations of fructose, glucose, you know, all these things here, uh, total phenols, lots of good stuff here. It decreased concentrations of nitrate, which is actually good, um, but it also decreased concentrations of protein. So um, if you are going to do, if you feel like this is something you want to try and do some sort of supplementation, um, these are the kind of things that you can expect potentially um, 
you know, maybe it's good for something like fruiting crops, but not as good for things like root vegetables. Um, but more importantly, can you increase CO2 naturally? And you kind of can, um, you know, with a good healthy soil, yes. Uh, one of the things though, is that can you increase it to a level that is, you know, you want to increase it as much as you can naturally. Um, so that would be like, uh, you know, a lot of what I recommend is using this space that's not going to be respiring a lot of carbon. Um, so that would be like your pathways, uh, using things like, oops, um, wood chips, straw, hay in your pathways or around your garden as much as you can. Um, cardboard also compost, right? Compost can be highly carbonaceous, uh, release a lot of carbon is with while your plants grow. Um, cardboard, like I said, the, you know, those sorts of things, just having those around your garden, taking up that space that you don't have other plants or other things that are necessarily respiring a lot of carbon, uh, like just a bare pathway. Um, having something like that could be, could be beneficial. Um, or, you know, in a, maybe in a tunnel, if you feel like getting adventurous, you could do beer, wine, those sorts of things that give off CO2. Keep posters do as well. I just say, if you're going to like start tinkering with this, um, to be a little bit more cautious, in my opinion, you know, inoculating your pathways with, um, you know, for instance, uh, wine caps, strafaria, wine, you know, wine caps that you saw a second ago. Um, these, those are fun. Does it, that's easy. You can put some wood chips in your pathway, inoculate it with, um, with uh, fungi and it's a really, really prolific consumer. It's a, uh, just consumes those wood chips pretty fast, um, but releases, you know, a good amount of carbon dioxide that way. Um, so that's probably a safer way of going about it. So the next one I want to talk about is microbes. These are management of microbes really comes down to, uh, well, let's just talk a little bit about, there's some evidence that plant, microbes have a say in plant behavior and shape. And there's, there's like a very logical way of looking at that, that they, you know, they fight off diseases and et cetera on the leaves, but there's also some evidence that they have some amount of say, like there's certain microbes that when they're present, they will actually change the shape, the shape of the plant will be different. Um, and I don't know if that's because they're turning on certain genes or what, but that's a, that's a really interesting factor. Um, they plants. So in, in the presence of the right microbes may be better at photosynthesizing, uh, protect plants. They protect plants for, and roots from pathogens. Um, they make nutrients available to plants. So like I said, they use those enzymes, they kind of spit on a rock particle and they get an enzyme out of, or a, a, you know, soil particle, and they get some sort of nutrient out of it that the plant needs. And then when the microbe dies, uh, it becomes available to the plant in a plant available form and they produce the CO2 and become much of that soil organic matter. And so good microbial stewardship, what does that look like? Compost, if possible. Compost is really overrated and underrated. Um, it's overrated because it's not always the best compost that people are using. I spent a lot of time on um, the quality of compost and the four types of compost in the book. I write a whole s a chapter on the four types of compost. Um, and but it's really good, even small amounts, even one ton per acre can it's been shown to increase microbial biomass. Um in that depending on even what you're, whatever you're using, uh, if you're doing, if you're doing hay fields, if you're doing, you know, broad acreage corner, if you're doing a market garden, like it's the, the increase from composting is really substantial. Uh, if it's good compost, it's decent compost. Um, it provides microbial food, uh, provides carbon nutrients and habitat, um, for the microbes. It increases microbial diversity, uh, it's a great way to get new microbes in your soil that may not been present before. Um, provides good soil coverage. Uh, that's, or you can provide some good soil coverage. This is a great way of good microbial stewardship. Um, so that would be like mulches. Mulches have a lot of benefits. That's one of them. Uh, weed suppression, water retention, and good microbial food and habitat. Um, and then focusing on your water management. Like I said, if the water dries, if the soil dries out, you're going to have die-offs of your microorganisms. They can recover, uh, but you may have lost some diversity within that recovery. So it's best to keep good, keep an eye on your water management. Um, and keeping the soil planted, we haven't talked enough about uh, the importance of things like cover crops. We will in a little bit, but keeping the soil planted as much as possible, right? Because the biggest thing, and I say this all the time, is if the soil is not being fed, by mulches and by plants, it is feeding on itself. This is what I was talking about with the bare fallow. If you're leaving your soil just bare, 
it's just consuming the carbon that is in it. Um, and another thing, you know, I don't have a spot in here to talk specifically about tillage per se, um, but the the biggest thing with tillage is that you are breaking, uh, you know, you have all these aggregates that I mentioned, the soil organic matter that that is, uh, you know, in this case, it would be like a piece of carbon or some sort of piece of soil organic matter is wrapped up in soil particles by these little, uh, this material that these, these microorganisms make. They essentially lock up this, this soil organic matter in particles, and it's inaccessible. It's not that accessible. It's less accessible that way. Um, that's how you get longer storage carbon. And the, what happens though, is that when you run a tiller through that system, you bust up those uh, soil or aggregates, right? With the carbon locked inside. And you, at the same time, really whip in a bunch of oxygen. So the oxygen loving bacteria, they start consuming the, um, that, that newly released carbon from the soil aggregates and they consume it. They, consume what is essentially all of your stored carbon, all of the work that the previous plants and crops were doing, um, they consume all of that and a lot of it and not necessarily all of it. Um, but these newly enriched, enlivened oxygen loving bacteria start to consume that they release carbon dioxide, but there's nothing above the soil to catch that carbon either. So it's kind of a loss in many forms that carbon dioxide just kind of floats into the atmosphere. Um, and you lose your soil organic matter. So, um, that's just a really important, uh, you know, way to think about uh, tillage and, and mechanical tillage specifically. Um, all right. So with all that in mind, with all those kind of things, like, what does it look like in practice? Like we can talk about theories and we can talk about like how, you know, the science of it, but what does it look like on a, in, in the field? Um, so let's talk about, I designed the book uh, around three gui guiding principles. These are the principles of conservation agriculture. I did not come up with these. Um, there's actually, I'm going to say four here. I did the book around three. You could do 50. You know, there's a bunch there. You could talk about a lot of different things when it comes to guiding principles. These three slash four are the most important in my mind, um, especially for our context, small scale market gardening. And uh, it starts right here, as we've talked about, keeping the soil covered as much as possible. And so keeping the soil covered as much as possible comes down to uh, mulches, right? Primarily um, that can be mulch from a terminated cover crop. It can be mulch from uh, hay, straw. This is, these are actually garlic that are mulched in hay. And I think there will be a picture later, but I have a crop rotation that is a, basically slower rotation stuff like garlic, sweet potatoes, um, corn, sweet corn, uh, and uh, potatoes and onions. And am I missing something? I feel like I'm missing something, but that basically that um, slower stuff all goes on the, oh, and like the late brassicas and oh, and winter squash. So all that stuff kind of goes on, on the outskirts of our, of our intensive garden. So that, that we manage with cover crops or, and, or hay. Um, because I'm not as worried about the weeds in these situations because I will tarp this or I will haul this out and plant a cover crop and then I will kill that with a tarp or something. Um, and I can talk about tarping. You can see these black tarps in the corner. Uh, I can talk about that. We try to use those as little as possible, but in this case, it, 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 it works for this system. Um, but the essentially that's, you know, that's one rotation for instance, but that's a great way of us, for us keeping our soil covered. And then in the intensive gardens where we grow our lettuce, our carrots, our, you know, uh, uh, green onions, uh, beets, that sort of stuff, we'd use a compost mulch instead. So lots of different stuff you can use as mulches, lots of different reasons to use as each as mulch. And we're actually going to talk about the different, that technique in a minute in a, a little bit more detail. Um, keep the soil planted as much as possible. This is the second principle. Uh, like I said, if the soil is not being fed, it's feeding on itself. So that mulches is also part of that. Like mulches can feed the soil if you don't want to have a crop in there um, because of logistics and all the reasons. But, um, you know, for us, one of the things is, and this is probably not unlike what you all are experiencing, we're getting heavier and heavier rainfalls. Last year, we had a four inch and four hour rainfall that just like, you know, threatened to devastate a bunch of stuff and washed out some of our carrots. Um, and so we are trying to modify our gardens in a way that 
allow that water to escape without escaping with soil particles. Um, so one of the things that we've been working on for the last few years is more, more and more living pathways. Um, and I have a, I have a bunch of information on that, but the, it, you know, towards the end, but the idea is just being maximized photosynthesis. I want the whole farm to be covered in green and red and et cetera. Um, so that's the second principle. Third principle is disturb the soil as little as possible. This is probably the most un misunderstood uh, principle. Um, and that's primarily because disturbance in, is often conflated with tillage. And those are not necessarily the same thing. Tillage and disturbance are uh, separate because we didn't go, I, I sometimes pair this with a conversation about tillage and what tillage is. Um, I didn't pair it with that this week because I wanted to make sure to fit in our hour and a half time frame. But the essentially tillage, I argue, is not about the tiller. It's not about the disc or the plow. Um, it's about things that we do that cause long-term harm to the soil. That's sort of the definition I put forth in the book. And that's the definition I often put forth uh, in these conversations is that, you know, um, Tillage is what we do that causes long-term harm to the soil. Disturbance can be a tool that we use to create long-term soil health. So, um, you know, no-till does not mean no engagement with the soil. Like in this case, this is a mulch, but even if this was just bare soil and I was pulling it aside and putting a, a plant in there, I'm putting a photosynthesizing plant into bare soil. That's a really special trick that, that we can do. You know, an hour earlier, this was an entirely different crop. So I can go from one crop to the other extremely fast with a photosynthesizing plant and put it in the soil. That's not something that nature can do on its own. So that is a, you know, that's one way in which disturbance can be beneficial. And this is like a, um, I think this is a video. Yeah. So this is the, um, another example of that. This is like the, um, you know, just a mulch that we have down, um, into some new raised beds. And we went from basically nothing blank slate here, uh, to instant garden, right? Cause we're able to do transplants. I do an auger bit. Um, that you saw me using there, maybe there at the very beginning. And I drill the holes. So there is some amount of disturbance, but it's, it's um, you know, managed with a, a very, yeah, there's the auger bit um, with a living plant. And that's the value. Uh, and when I say auger bit, it's just, a, it's literally an auger on a drill. I don't know if I have a better picture in here. Maybe I do. Um, and another example of disturbance being beneficial, this was a really compacted area of our farm. And these were new beds. Like I said, we just moved here in December of 2020. And um, this is me broad forking. And what I'm doing here is I'm just lightly, you know, I'm getting the broad fork into the soil and I'm kind of popping it a little bit. Um, I don't do this for all of my beds. I check to see if the bed is compacted. And then if there's bad compaction and I don't think the plant is going to do well, I do this to kind of break that up a little bit. And the difference between this and a tiller is that the intention here, the purpose of this is to create long-term soil health, to allow the, the, the crop to better photosynthesize, right? Um, if I was just to shove plants in here, they wouldn't do well. So what's, so my, I know that the, the you know, this can be often be a controversial tool, but if I just put plants in here, they're not going to do well. So what's better for soil health is doing a small amount of disturbance like this that ultimately makes itself obsolete. I do this for a couple of years or maybe even one season or a few seasons, just depends on the soil um, and the amount of compaction, but I do this for a while and then I don't have to do it anymore. So it kind of, you know, it makes itself obsolete, but what's worse for the soil putting, you know, doing this small amount of disturbance and making sure the plants are really successful at photosynthesizing or not doing this disturbance out of a sort of dogma and it not and the plant's not doing well, not photosynthesizing well, not feeding the soil well. So this is one of the most important things is, you know, just rethinking some of these ideas. And like, for instance, uh, when we talk about disturbance and tillage, like this is Indonesia, right? This, and it's modern Indonesia. There's a road down here. There's its, you know, satellite tower or something up here. Um, but this is probably what Indonesia has looked like for, you know, some, in some way, the agriculture there has looked like for thousands of years. Um, you know, you have a wild diversity, plants, trees, uh, you have, you know, maybe some sweet potatoes or something here, like you have this wild diversity here. Um, and it's extremely bountiful, but you also have a lot of disturbance, right? Some disturbance was required to get that set up or like in our farm. Um, I turned all these beds and later turned all of these beds and these beds so that they would drain better. So it took some amount of disturbance, but ultimately the goal is to have something really bountiful. So it may take some disturbance up front, but the, the argument I always make is like tillage is things that causes long-term harm to the soil. 
disturbance is something that you use as a tool to create long-term soil health. Um, so, you know, that's why we manage these in permanent beds. So we don't have to move them after they're fully set up and we're satisfied with where they are. Um, and, um, oh, this is where I do that. This is that picture I was thinking. This is the where we do that slow rotation plots over here. This is where we do the high rotation stuff. So this is like closest to the wash pack. This is where we wash and pack our vegetables. And right here we have like a little wash station. Um, this, you know, this is where we do the most intensive crops, although we had garlic in it early in that season because we didn't have all these beds set up. But next, you know, going into this next year, we're back to having this high rotation here, low rotation on the on the sides there. Um which I think is a really good way of managing it. Cause one of the things about what we're going to talk about next uh, after I get through these, these, um, these principles is the different systems and it's okay to hybridize. It's okay to use two or three different systems. Um, so, so principle number four, I wrapped this into all the other ones in the book, but is also grow as diversely as possible. And it doesn't necessarily have to be cash crops, just a diversity of crops pulling in a diversity of, um, pushing in a diversity of root exudates uh, that draw in a diversity of microbes. That is really good um, for on many levels, but, you know, and also using a diversity of life promoting input. So the compost, obviously, but also things like biostimulants and, um, you know, uh, you know, other nutrients, uh, maybe compost extracts and those sorts of things to really get the soil life fed and happy and, and, and operating at a high level. Um, so these are those principles. Uh, these are the four. This is arguably the most important part because my soil is not going to be the same as your soil. My farm is not going to be the same as your farm is, and your farm is probably not going to be the same as your neighbor's farm. I, um, oh, I don't have the slide in here. I usually do a thing about context and how important that is. Um, and one of the things I'll say is that our farm, our old farm, it was about, uh, you know, we, we had really good drainage there and it was really windy though. And we were very exposed to the sun. So the summers were brutal. There was not a lot of coverage. Like our new farm has some good shade, um, from trees, which I think you can see like in this picture, there's like some nice shady trees around. Um, but our old farm was very hot and it was very intense. Um, and it couldn't have been much different. It couldn't have been more different. It was a very different farm. And it's 15 minutes from the farm I'm on now. Like I have to farm them completely different. And the farm is just down the road. So it's really important that you do these things based on your context and your soil, um, based on your compaction is how much you're going to have to disturb it. Um, you know, based on your crops is how much you're going to have to keep it, what you're going to keep it planted with. Um, and, you know, just always keeping in mind um, keeping it as diverse as possible for your for your situation, just as possible is the most important part of all of those. All right, so let's talk about some different systems. Um, I like starting out with a cover crop system because it's the one that I think I have the most fun with, even though sometimes it can be a little challenging getting stuff to terminate. Um, but the cover crop system is, uh, you know, we still use these permanent beds and we're still doing this without tillage, um, but we are using some plastic to terminate these a lot of times, or depending on the crop, we can mow it. Um, just depends on what cover crop it is and what time of year, but um, cover crops are extremely valuable. You know, if you can use them, it's genius because you're really just, you're tricking your soil, you're tricking all these plants into growing these really, uh, you know, a lot of above ground biomass and a lot of below ground biomass and all this, you know, all these nutrients, but before they can, um, you know, put it into their young, put it into their seeds, you kill them and you take all that stuff from them. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's really effective at growing the, but it's really effective at growing all the nutrients that you need and all the, um, soil organic matter, you know, it's just really, really the best crops that I ever have are the ones that I, um, proceed with a cover crop. Um, so they enhance soil respiration. This isn't just, um, you know, carbon dioxide. It's everything that needs to come in and out of the soil. Um, so soil respiration is primarily carbon dioxide, but it's, it's, it's everything. Like you need to be able, your soil needs to be able to breathe. And when we talk about compaction, leaving bare soil open, a lot of times it gets compacted from the rain, like surface compaction. There's kind of two different forms of compaction. There's like deep compaction and surface compaction. Um, Surface compaction traps in a lot of those, the, a lot of the breath, the, the carbon dioxide, but all the other uh, gases that are being released by microbes. So that can be really toxic to your plants. Um, and 
increasing soil respiration means that you're getting an increase in your microbial biomass as well. Um, they keep the soil in place and fed, so cover crops do, uh, between crops. So you're not losing your soil particles. You're not, you're not getting a lot of compaction, losing, getting a lot of erosion. Um, they can act as a mulch. I mean, all of these things are pretty well known, but it's good to just kind of go back over them. Um, they can act as a mulch because they do create, this is rye and vetch and uh, crimson clover and some other things. Uh, they can, you know, that grows pretty tall, grows several feet in the air. And, um, you know, it, 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 when we terminate them, they create a nice little mulch, depending on what you're growing. Um, they can increase nutrients for the subsequent crops. So um, that's, that's definitely a value. And they occupy children really well, especially when they're super tall. Sometimes you can lose your kids, but it, it, at least it keeps them busy for a little bit. Um, second, maybe only to the trampoline. Where, where it works well, where cover crops work well. Um, pretty much everywhere. Areas with moderate to high rainfall, uh, Areas with low rainfall can be a little bit more complicated because you're, you may have to water them. But since we're talking to primarily people in Indiana and in our region, um, we don't have to worry about that. I think we all have maybe not all the rainfall we want, but a lot of it. Um, the, in, in some years, I have way too much. Uh, it works, you know, cover crops work in all soil types. They work on medium to large scales. Um, they are most crop types, though direct seeding is a bit more complicated. Uh, because you have to really plan out what cover crops you're going to use. Winter killed cover crops are better for direct seeded crops and things like buckwheat, the buckwheat and legumes. Those are two that can be killed really quickly. Um, so great for expanding into new areas with low capital investment. And um, like, for instance, you don't want to. Uh, well, wow, one of the, the, they had the keynote and then it was soil health. Oh. Okay. Hi, Mike, we have you on unmuted. So they are um, great for expanding into areas with low capital investment. And the value with that is that the, um, the uh, you know, a lot of times like you're doing maybe like a deep compost litter, deep compost mulch rather, and that can be really expensive. So you can do it with cover crops much more affordably. Um, where it may not work are regions with very low rainfall. And, um, you know, and I just put these so I don't miss anything very small scales, sometimes it can lock up your season for a long time to have a cover crop so if you're only operating on an acre or half an acre or something cover crops are really difficult to work in maybe like a fast run of buckwheat but something like winter rye, that you're really not going to be able to plant into these until June um, is not going to be great at least not for every bed so you really have to plan that out. Um, and of course, farms with a lot of direct seeded cover crops, uh, or cover direct seeded crops like carrots and that sort and baby greens, those sorts of things can be more complicated, uh, choosing a cover crop. Um, you know, what's in, what's the next crop. It's good to know what you're going to be following that cover crop with, uh, you know, you don't want to, for instance, grow something that's going to, uh, like I'd mentioned the direct seeded crops, but also maybe like, um, if you are going to have to plant lettuce immediately after rye, that can be a little intense because you have such a thick mulch to deal with. Um, so it's good to know, choose your cover crops based on what's going to follow it. Um, what do you need from the cover crop? Cover crops are great because you can use them for uh, nitrogen fixation with legumes, for instance, or you can use them for uh, deterrent, uh, disease deterrence, like mustard, you know, mustards and those sorts of things. Although I'm not totally sold on biofumigation, I think it, it doesn't hurt. Um, so that would be like your brassicas, your mustards oftentimes are bio, what are called biofumigants. They actually kind of de, uh, you know, depopulate the soil from certain fungal diseases potentially. Um, but also phosphorus gatherers like, a, a buckwheat is said to be a good, good at gathering phosphorus. There's, I actually have a whole bunch of information about that in the book. Um, and then how it will be terminated. Uh, you know, how, how are you going to get rid of that cover crop when you plant it? Those are kind of the things that are going to go into choosing your cover crop. Um, any cover crop, you know, anything can be used for a cover crop pretty much. Uh, but buckwheat, you know, these are like, there's actually no vetch and cereal rye in this photo, but there's uh, mung bean, like that's not a typical cover, any sort of bean, any sort of legume like that. Um, sorghum, Sudan grass, sun hemp, um, buckwheat, all of these, you, you can use so many different things. Uh, and it doesn't, it, you can also use lettuce. I use a lot of cilantro. Um, I use arugula sometimes. I, I will throw in a lot of brassicas. One of my, my mentor used to do a whole plot that was just um, 
all the fall brassicas, all the mustards, the kales, the collards, we would throw in turnips, uh, daikon radishes. And then we would just harvest out of that for, for winter shares um, all the way up until hard frost. And that was a great winter cover crop. And then it would kind of flower in the spring and keep it covered all winter, flower in the spring, can feed you for most of the winter. And then, you know, in our region, uh, and this was a little further south than here, but yeah, it worked really well. And then you'd have sort of a combination crop garden and uh, cover crop. So lots of things can be used. It doesn't have to just be what you get in the cover crop magazine. Um, organic termination, we do want to touch on this for a minute. Um, a lot of the, the easiest way to deal with really thick stuff is either use the elements. So using um, winter, we get decent winters here. We can kill things like peas and we can get kill things like um, oats don't always reliably kill for us. Maybe they do up there where you are, but they don't always reliably kill for us. But peas do, um, field peas specifically. Any summer cover crop can be used as a winter kill cover crop. Um, so that'd be like sorghum Sudan and Sespania and all those ones. Um, so then it grows really tall, dies from the winter, and it creates like a nice little mulch. Um, uh, and then the other thing that we do is we'll throw a tarp over this for several weeks and kill it that way. Um, so smash it down with something. Uh, you can use a lot of different things. We, in this case, we actually just ran it over with our rotary plow um, or with our power harrow without it working. Just the power harrow was up, set up high. It's just a very heavy implement. We just knocked it down. You could use a crimper and then you could throw a tarp over top of that. Um, that's uh, Daniel Mays does a lot of good details on that in his book, uh, The Organic No-Till Vegetable Farm. I think I get that title right. Um, and uh, you can crimp, but on permanent raised beds, it's really hard to kill it with a crimp. So I recommend one of these other uh, additional things, like maybe even throwing some more mulch over top of it um, just to get it to die because you don't want to uh, have to be competing with your cover crop. Um, and I've had that happen and it's not pretty. Um, so it can it can really make it difficult for, for you to farm. Um, all right, so let's talk about another system. I want to make sure that I'm staying on time here. Uh, no, okay, so the no dig uh, system, often called the deep compost mulch system, this is a deep layer of compost on top of cardboard, um, and essentially the compost acts both as the growing medium and as the mulch, so for water retention and feeding the soil. Um, this is, it's, you know, it's been popularized by people like Charles Dowding and Richard Perkins, and we've done it a lot on our farm. My buddy Josh Satin has some good videos about it. Um, it's, it's not without nuance, right? Um, so we're going to talk about, you know, so, oh, and often I should just mention, oftentimes it's paired with wood chips. Uh, wood chips do make a good pairing, makes it very aesthetically pleasing. We don't use wood chips a lot in our fields because they wash out. And we're on a bit of a slope. Um, so that makes things a little bit more challenging for us, but with the wood chips, uh, I do like them undercover and I do have them in this pathway cause it's a walkway. So we smash them down enough. They don't wash out as bad, but generally speaking, we get such heavy rainfalls that they, you know, all at once that they wash out the, wash out the wood chips or they float and they end up on top of our bed surfaces, which we don't really want. Um, so where this system works well, when I say deep, I'm talking four, eight, even 10 inches of compost deep. So pretty deep. Um, the deeper, the more weed suppression you're going to get. So you lay your cardboard down, then you layer your compost over that, and then you put your pathways, you fill those with wood chips. Um, and, you, and you want it pretty deep, uh, generally speaking. Um, where it works well, areas with low to moderate rainfall. Places with heavy rainfall, like I said, you can get some washout. Um, you can also, uh, excuse me. You can also get um, uh, some anaerobic areas if you're on really heavy clay. Uh, cold to mild regions. Uh, it's nice in, a, in the winter time to have this warm, dark soil to plant into. We plant all year too. We don't, there's no, since there's no tilling, since I don't have to wait for the soil to dry out. Um, I did work on a tillage farm for many years. I, I definitely have, un, have seen the difference um, that this has made to my soil and to my farm and to just my life, uh, my lifestyle. Um, growing without tillage, but the, the cold to mild region is really nice in the winter to have this warm stuff that you can plant into, and then you can cover it really well and you can get crops really early that way. Um, you're not having to wait for every, like everybody else for a good dry spell. Um, areas with access to good compost. If, you're, if your neighbor has some horse manure and it's kind of you know somewhat mature, that's not necessarily gonna be what you want, right? Like you want good compost that's been considerate, considerately, if that's a word, made with consideration um, 
and is not going to have a lot of weeds in it and is going to, you know, be able to, uh, to feed your plants. Um, and I, like I said, I talk about the four different types of compost in the book and just which ones you want to look for when you're trying to set up a system like this. Um, cause you also don't want something that has like a lot of herbicides in it, a lot of yard waste potentially, or something that could retain, have a lot of, uh, uh, long lasting, uh, you know, uh, herbicide in it because you don't want that for your plants. Um, smaller scale is better because it's a lot of material handling. Um, it, you can do it on a larger scale, larger scales, larger scale I've seen is 20 acres that does kind of a deep compost mulch and that's local harvest out in, um, uh, Chilliwack, British Columbia. We did an interview with him for the podcast. You can look up, um, medium to heavy soils, uh, it's sandy soils can be complicated or really, really fast draining soils can be complicated because they, um, if you have a mulch or a compost or a mulchy compost in this case, um, that doesn't retain its moisture very well. And it gets into the sand. You're just going to have it's moisture retention is going to become really difficult, especially if you don't address that low soil organic matter, um, in your, in your sand, um, in your sandy soil in your native soil, um, farms producing high profit crops. If you're producing lower profit crops, the, um, you know, it may not work out financially, you know, you may grow the most beautiful corn ever, but it, it's going to, you know, you're going to be losing thousands of dollars an acre. Um, and then covered areas. So, uh, areas that are, you know, under tunnels. So they're not, it's not washing out quite as badly. Um, And this is just for me to remember to make sure that I touch on all the things that are important. The other thing that's often comes up with this, and I get asked about it almost every time, so I want to make sure to address it, is um, nutrient overload. And um, I think as organic farmers, we need to be very considerate of the amount of nutrient excesses that we're putting on our soil. Um, we, if we're not incapable of polluting, right? Um, and I've seen you know, some of my soil tests are heavy with phosphorus, phosphorus excess excesses. Um, and I've talked to a lot of agronomists about this and they're more concerned with nitrogen, um, and actually potassium, uh, Neil Kinsey to, I had a conversation with him for the podcast actually, where he talked about potassium being potentially an issue. Um, but generally speaking, they're not as concerned with that because of the lack of mobility. And if you're growing stuff all the time, you're going to lock a lot of those nutrients in place. I also recommend just using like the carbon is not just there for the CO2, but it, and for the water retention and the pathways, um, and the nutrients that, that wood chips, you know, something like wood chips bring. Um, but it also helps to lock up some of those excess nutrients. So that's, that's something to think about as well. Um, and so there's no good answer for that. If you're, if you're going to be losing your compost, like the actual compost particles into a waterway, it's maybe something I wouldn't consider doing this system, uh, because then you may be genuinely polluting. Um, but you know, by and large, your soil should be happy, uh, you know, using, using that system. Um, especially if you use good compost. And like I said, I go into detail on that in the book. Uh, no or low mulch no-till. So this is the next technique we're going to kind of talk about. And um, the uh, basically with this system, um, you're doing not dissimilar to the deep compost mulch system, but you're adding a really kind of thick layer of compost. This is the first year on these beds, but you do layer add a kind of a thick layer of compost and then you lightly work in the top two inches of soil um, and you get a... Uh, you know, you get this kind of, you get some of the soil particles mixed in with your, your compost. So over time, and when I say work in, I'm talking about like with a harrow or with a tilter or with a rake, um, you're just lightly working it in. So you're mixing in just a little bit of those soil particles, a little bit of those clays um, and some, and, and things that may help retain some of the moisture within the compost. So it makes it really good for direct seeding um, and that sort of thing, because you have that moisture retention. And that's the, that's the basic idea is that you, you are doing relatively thick layer of compost. Um, and then you're sort of lightly working that into the soil. So over time, you know, I've seen a lot of farms that have done this for many, many years. And we were a farm, one of those farms uh, on our last farm. Um, but basically the, um, you know, the soil starts to resemble a mulch. Like it looks like a mulch, but it just retains moisture better. Um, I like this system. Uh, and 
you know, anyone who's hung up on the idea of it being too much, too similar to tillage, you also have to think the majority of what you want to protect in the soil is about four to six to eight inches down, right? That's called your rhizosphere. Um, you don't want to mess with that any more than you have to. And because that's where a lot of those soil aggregates are, that's where a lot of your soil organic matter is, that's where a lot of the microbial life is. But those first two inches, you get a little bit of play. Um, and, the, and mixing in those soil particles with your compost is not the worst idea. Um, so that's a, that's a method. It did, and, you know, let's talk about where it works and where it doesn't. Uh, covered areas, I think it works really well in tunnels because you don't, one of the risks, are, two risks are, excessive uh, weed populations, right? You're going to be dealing with a lot more weed populations um, and, uh, you know, erosion. So those are the two kind of things that come to mind when I think about this system is that you're, it's more a vulnerable system. And when you have a mulch, you don't have any weed issues, but when you have something like a, a you know, like a light kind of, uh, you know, more soil based mulch on the top, um, then you do run into the, run the risk of erosion. Um, it does work in practically any soil type. I do think if you're working on sand that you would, should address your your base soil organic matter first. So yes, maybe even tilling in some soil or some car some uh, compost, and um, you know just improving that soil organic matter before you're setting up your system your beds, um, because you don't want too much drainage. Right, water management is really important. Uh, so I would rather deal with getting rid of some of the compaction that I maybe originally caused by doing the tillage, then trying to um, improve soil organic matter really slowly. Uh, so that that's, I think, you know, in my mind, that is fair game. If you want to do it, go the other way, that's fine too. Um, where mulches are not available, right? Some people, not everybody has access to decent compost. Um, maybe you can make enough of your own to do a good, decent layer on top, but not enough of your own to make, um, you know, an actual mulch out of it. So that could be, you know, a, a situation where you'd want to use a system like this. And it works great for baby greens and other direct seeded crops. Um, yeah, and then backsplash on plants is also something that's to take into consideration when you have the soil particles and maybe some of the things that come along with the soil particles, you also risk run the risk of things like uh, fungal diseases and uh, does it just stuff splashing up on your plants, making them dirty, um, those sorts of things. Uh, and also wind prone areas where you may run into wind erosion. Lightly colored mulches, carbonaceous mulches. We're going to talk about this really quick and I'm going to make sure and I leave enough time for um, talking about living pathways too. I'm going to dissect that a little bit more as well. So lightly colored uh, carbonaceous mulch, no-till. This would be like straw and hay. Uh, we do our garlic and, and hay. We don't, we're not really in a grain, there's not many grain growers around me. So hay is not really or straw is not really something that's very much available. Straw being the stock of, of a grain. Um, hay being the, you know, fresh cut grass is really available to me. It's more complicated to use because of the weed seed issue. But if you use those tarps, if you put a large opaque tarp over top and sort of let that burn up some of those weed seeds, that's a, one way of dealing with that. Um, and then, you know, uh, just being judicious about when you're, when and how you're using it. Um, where this system works well, Arid regions. Uh, our region, it can work really well in the summer times. You could use it as a hybridization using light mulches in the summer. Not, I see a lot of people up north kind of starting sort of the roof stout method um, and just employing, you know, a light colored mulch from the beginning. But if you're really far up north, this is going to keep your soil really cool for a very long time. And that's not necessarily a benefit. Um, because it's going to slow down your crop production at the beginning of the season. Uh, it may have benefits in the middle of the season, but in the beginning of the season, that can be that can be a problematic. And it's great in warmer regions for that reason, because it can cool your cool excuse me cool cool your soil down, and uh, in effect keep it from getting too hot. Like you know, microbes will move further into the soil as it starts to get above 80, 85 degrees. Like you want to keep it um, more in that 75 to 82 kind of range. Um, the hotter you get you know, 70 to 80 range, rather, the hotter you get, you, you know, you're, you're going to start, um, your microbes are not going to be as active, they're going to start moving further into the soil, like you want to keep your soil a little bit cool, uh, especially in the summer. And um, also, you're not going to burn up your soil organic matter that's closer to the surface, you know, if it's if it's too hot, too dry. Um, regions with very heavy rain events, it's great for protecting from excessive rain, or intense rain events. Uh, 
grain and grass growing regions where the materials are actually available and affordable. Um, we'll see how that plays out this summer, but uh, generally we've been able to afford, you know, $3 bales of hay, um, longer season crops. So, uh, and then good hay too, because you can buy really good hay here. And if it's if it's good for keeping a cow alive all winter, it's great for keeping your soil alive. Um, longer season crops, you know, things like corns and uh, you know winter squash and uh, garlic. Those are really excellent crops for hay and mulch for hay and straw and lighter color mulches. Um, small to medium scale because it's relatively easy to spread this much mulch, but it is more material handling. And then all soil types, though sand can be a little trickier with something like light colored mulches uh because again the the drainage issue um it just drains a little bit too quickly regions uh with short seasons um again where it's cold where direct seeded crops are likely you're not going to want to use a mulch like this because it's there's nothing i don't know as of this moment if there's any there are a few tools on the market that I've found that can drill into some pretty thick mulches, drill seeds into some pretty thick mulches, like hand pushed. Um, but there, I haven't tested any of them, and I don't know the expense. I think they're somewhat on the like five to seven hundred dollar range for that seeder. Um, so you'd really, if that's something you wanted to look into, it you'd have to really make your you make the most out of it. Um, and yeah, those are we covered all those other things. So I already mentioned haver straw. Um, I don't think there's really anything to say beyond that this was like uh, after a cover crop and then I put in some hay just down the pathways and underneath the plants uh, just to add a little bit of an additional mulch through the later part of the season. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's necessarily anything more to say about that. I will mention wood chips. This is one I get asked about a lot. Um, I don't recommend wood chips necessarily as a, as a um, surface mulch. They tend to be... Um, they, they don't take up as much nitrogen as people think, but they do take up some, and they are also going to cool your soil. Um, uh, and they're, they're really only going to take up nitrogen where the, where the material is touching. Um, it's all about surface area, but that's, that's, that's not that important. I think they're great in the pathways, not necessarily great on the bed surfaces. Um, great in a compost, though. Mix them into your compost. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, I do want to mention bed turnovers just kind of just dissect this a little bit because I feel like this is an area where people uh, have a lot of questions. Um, and let me see where I'm doing. Did I have it till 245? I think is when I said I was going to go to. So I'll try and get through this pretty quickly, but make sure that I leave time for questions. Um, so this is the base of a, of a spinach plant. It's about 0 0.03 pounds. Now, what I used to do was just pull the crop up, the whole crop, and I would take it all to the compost pile and that would be it. Like I would just pull the whole crop out of the ground and then oftentimes I would till it or I would just till it in or whatever. But, um, you know, really when you start thinking of actually doing that math, 0 0.03 pounds multiplied by 12 to 1500 plants, depending on how big your bed is, that's like 40 pounds of material that you're removing from that soil that this plant just, you know, spent this whole time creating. So that's roots, it's microbes, um, it's nutrients, it's all sorts of stuff. Uh, so what we do instead is that we cut the plant off at the surface level and leave the root in the soil. So without that tillage effect, it's not going to, it's not going to, um, you know, the plants, not the soil's not going to lock up and need to digest this. It's going to be a very slow process. So it's not going to affect the next crop that goes in. So I cut this out of plant surface. I do take this to the, to the compost. That's going to be the best way to retain that soil organic, that, that organic matter, rather that biomass. Um, but I do want to leave this in the soil to just kind of decompose and then leave all these roots here so that these, the next plant that goes into the soil right next to where this one was usually like maybe we'll transplant actually we did we transplanted lettuce right into these this bed um so those these microbes can slowly migrate over to those to that next root um so we always want to leave this the roots in the soil when we harvest or when we uh, flip the bed and uh, i think this is a video too yeah so um and also just in the, i only put this video in here because it's important to see like Plant this little technique of planting with both your hands is really important. Um, it speeds. It. We use only soil blocks for our for our for our soil, but I do plant with both hands. I can plant a fifty foot bed in like twenty minutes, and that's not as fast as something like the paper pot transplanter or something like that. But it's pretty fast, and I've found that the paper pot doesn't really work in our system. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with that, just look up paper pot. There's lots of videos on it. Uh, but 
this is a system that works really well and it grows great starts and great plants. And we just have used it for years and years, but using both hands is really important. So anyway, principles of a bed flip, um, terminate the previous crop. So that's why I cut it off at surface level. Some crops will need to be cut below ground. I do kind of go into that in the book. Um, the so you want to terminate the previous crop our biggest weed issue and we don't have a lot of weed issues um but the biggest weed we ever have is always the previous crop like it just didn't terminate it enough and it's not the never the end of the world to have to pull out a lettuce plant um you know in your spinach or whatever it may be uh so we remove any weeds that we see so this would be the whole thing we'd terminate that crop cut it out at surface level um take that to the compost pile we remove any weeds that we see we fertilize if need be i use um, usually fertilizing compost, which is like a, you know, maybe a chicken manure compost, but I'll also use like a really nice inoculating compost. This is two of the types of two of the four types inoculating and fertilizing. Um, so I'll use something like that. I'll use some kelp, uh, and a little bit of humic acid, or maybe some activated biochar if I have it. Um, so I'll kind of do that before every heavy feeder light feeders. I don't really do another additional, but I'll also sometimes switch up that fertilizing compost with something like alfalfa meal or, um, uh, yeah, what if I use fish meal, stuff like that. Like I like to have a diversity of inputs. Um, so then I'll assess and address the compaction issue after I put the, the fertilizer down, which means that I will, um, go through with a piece of rebar with my hands and just see kind of like what I'm dealing with, with compaction. I also have a penetrometer, but those are really expensive. They're like 250 or $300. Um, so you don't need that. You just need, uh, you know, you can just tell with a, um, uh, rebar, just stick a piece of rebar into the soil and see if it, if you can do, if you can get it in deep into the soil without putting a lot of pressure on it, that's the, that means you don't have the, you probably don't have to address your compaction. You don't have to worry about broad forking. Um, and then I replant or some people subsoiling. Um, and then I replant it as fast as possible, right? As possible. Um, it's okay if it goes out of, if it's not planted absolutely immediately, but try and replant it as quickly as you can. Um, so that's how our bed flips work. Uh, I do before I take any question. Well, um, yeah, I'm going to just run through this really quickly and try and take several minutes of questions if I can. Um, we do so we do living pathways they're wonderful it's like farming in a park um it's really soft it's really great for harvesting the bins don't get dirty um you know it's just really delightful there are challenges though um the reason that we did it was primarily the the we wanted the rain to go away and we didn't want to have to manage these with a hoe it's much faster to just mow these really fastly than fast fastly quickly than it is to um to, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, use a hoe to manage all your weeds and stuff in a bare soil. Or like I said, we can't put wood chips there. They just wash out. So um, it's, it's good for places with abundant water access. Cause if you have to water your pathways, right. It, yeah, that's, that's, that's obnoxious. Uh, we do all overhead watering. So they get inadvertently watered anyway. Um, good on slopes um, and farms, with low organic matter can help. We allow these to grow pretty tall during the, during the spring, and then we'll mow it and that'll kill it like a cover crop, kill it back like a cover crop. So a lot of those roots will die, releasing those nutrients for the beds to access. Um, and like I mentioned, I'll do a talk on Monday about intercropping. Uh, and then we mow, we, this is our mower. It's a 60 volt uh, Greenworks mower and it's 17 inches. Uh, this is kind of an expensive setup. I, if, if I could do it over again, I would actually just get I would just set up my bed widths. They're 18 inches. I would just set it up to my 24 inch BCS flail mower. So whatever mower you have, if you're going to do this, set up your beds, set up your pathways to the actual mower size that you already have instead of buying something special. Um, it's just, it's expensive and it's, you know, it's just another thing to manage and take care of and find, you know, when you need it. And um, um, I'll get back to this. I do want to mention the, the, edger that we use uh, is the Greenworks edger. Again, this is way more expensive than it should be. And all I'm doing here is going about an inch into the soil, but I'm cutting off those rhizomes so that I'm not having grass creep into it, but I'm keeping the rhizosphere intact, cutting off those little creepy rhizomes. Um, and uh, it's a Greenworks 60 volt edger. It's that setup is way too expensive for the job, but it is, it's effective. But like I said, I would rather just use whatever mower I have and then maybe buy an edger on top of that because that would you know reduce the price a lot. Um, and you can also do a hoe. You can do a lot of different. You know what we use like a little hook hoe um, that uh, Haas makes, and that works pretty well. We tried a bunch of stuff. You 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 can make it work. And then we just clean up the edges as need be. Um, and these are some of the possible crops. 
it, honestly, nature is going to choose what's in there. So I would put some good clovers down and then just expect that unless you're dealing with Bermuda grass, if you're dealing with Bermuda grass, you're going to have to maybe manage that differently. Um, but we just do clovers, um, white and red clover, and then chamomile. I'm experimenting with that because I'd like to try and find some that don't need mowing. Um, but anyway, I wanted to, I didn't want to spend too much time on that because I wanted to open it up and make sure to answer the questions you all had. So, uh, so let's do that. If you have, um, I don't know if it's going to be Kevin. Uh, let's see if I can find my, yeah, if anybody has questions in the chat, maybe I can just go through them if nobody wants to jump in and moderate. I, I got it, Jesse. I'm here. Okay, there you are, Laura. So I have some, oops, is that I yeah, I have some that I was pulling up from the beginning. So the first one you got earlier on in your presentation was a question about, have you ever had experience with or used biochar, charcoal, or the Terra Preta method? I don't know if I'm saying that right. No, that's all right. Yeah. Um, yeah, biochar, I mentioned, I, I kind of do mix that it sometimes into our, I'll actually prefer to mix it into our compost. So like, I would buy biochar, there's a lot of different ways of making it. And there's a lot of ways of making it really mediocre. You could study that and do it like you can study it and do a good job of making your own biochar, or you can buy a small amount, mix it into a really good compost that you have. And then that way it kind of gets out into your soil, it gets inoculated, it gets, you know, um, you just have to make sure that it, you're, you're, you're not putting raw uh, biochar in your soil. Cause it can suck up your nitrogen a little bit, almost like a wood chip can. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I don't have any problems with that. Yeah. I think that method's good. Great. The next one we had was, uh, what's the best way to plant cover crops? Yeah. So, uh, ideally you get them soil seed to soil contact. Um, you know, uh, let's say that you're starting a garden from fresh and you don't want to till it like it's in decent shape and you could you could throw something like a tarp over top of it to kill back that grass and then you can direct seed it um anytime you broadcast something it really needs to get pressed into the soil as well uh you're not going to get the germination you want except for some clovers do okay um germinating just being broadcast but by and large like you want good seed to soil contact um and that means, uh, you know, one of the things, one of the tools we'll use is the Jang seeder with the um, uh, double disc opener. And that double disc opener is not like your classic seed drill. It's not going to like open up uh, sod, for instance, but it will actually drill really well into like kind of rough soil. Um, so we use that as a good way to, to get uh, cover crop sown. Um, sometimes if I do have to broadcast it for some reason, like the soil is just too rough for that. Um, I'll sow it and then I'll rake as much as I can just to kind of get it covered up. And then I'll run over it with a heavy bed roller just to press it into the soil and then water. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, the, the, it just depends on the situation, but getting that seed to soil contact is essential. Great. Um, Chris Royal, I just wanted to say here, this is being recorded. So any of you that have registered for the conference will have access to this later if you missed some of it. Um, and then also feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions directly to Jesse. Um, if to make it a little easier, if you can go down to that reactions in the bottom of your screen and raise your hand so we can sort of help facilitate who's speaking when, that would be great. Um, one other question that was put in the chat, but I think you covered it because it was before you went into the the cover cropping in the pathways. So. Um, urban soil health, if you would like him to elaborate on that, please add another question. Um, have you found that intercropping makes your crop rotations more complicated? Oh, I will discuss crop rotations in the intercropping uh, conversation on Monday, but um, no, because the way that I do it. So like I mentioned the, um, you know, the uh, slow rotation crops kind of on the outside of our gardens, and then the high rotation stuff in the middle, the high rotation is where I'm doing the most intercropping. Um, but my intercrops are always, uh, you know, my crops for those high rotations are, uh, I, I don't do this in the ex exact order, but it's usually carrots, beets, green onions, lettuce, um, arugula, radishes, uh, and maybe a couple other things like a couple odds and ends here, fennel, that sort of stuff, celery. Um, and then maybe I'll have a longer season thing in there, like some cherry tomatoes or something in the late season. So, um, the idea there is that, um, I just don't, I just don't repeat crops. So 
even if I split the beds in two crops, which I'll talk about on Monday, I just don't repeat. So I'll take like, if I have lettuce in there, I'll just go to green onions and then I'll just go to something else out and something else and something else. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's, it, it, it makes sense over time because you just, you're never repeating the same crop within a 12 month period. Um, but I'm doing four or five different crops within that bed. So the diversity is really high. Um, and unless I saw like a disease issue, would I ever really have to think too much about it? But by and large, our, 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 um, our, uh, you know, our consume, our, uh, um, certifier, we're certified organic. They're, they're fine with that rotation that I've kind of described. Great. Um, I switched to share my screen because we do have a QR code and a evaluation that we are asking you to fill out. So while we do some more Q&A here, please hold up your cell phone over that QR code or go to the chat and click on the link that I put in there to fill out that quick survey. Um, I don't see any hands of people wanting to unmute, so I'm going to go to the next question from the chat, which is, do you like Johnny's or similar hand broadcaster for cover crop seeding? Any issues with getting a good diverse mix established if you have small versus large seed sizes in the broadcaster? I haven't used those broadcasters in like 10 years. Um, I can't really speak to that. I, I do it by hand out of a bucket. I usually have the kids come out. Um, which is terrible because sometimes I have like these really thick patches. I have found my little three-year-old just piling rye into one spot. So there's a really nice set of rye there. Um, but no, I mean, I usually just use a bucket and then I broadcast it really high. That's it. I mean, it's just, that for me is easier. Um, and I just walk back and forth in, you know, kind of a triangle method. Uh, that was my mentor taught me. Um, so yeah, I've used those in the past and I don't honestly remember, uh, I just feel like by hand is, is easier. And I often mix in a little bit of vermicast. Like I'll rub the seed with some good vermicast, some uh, some good compost. It's just some good compost or whatever you have. Um, and then have that in there too. So that, that will help with a little bit of the seed to soil contact, but also some inoculation. Great. Um, Marla asked, you mentioned moving to a new farm. What does your start system for new ground look like? You know, it, it's kind of changed now because I've never dealt with such a wet farm as we're on now. Um, now, I really, really, if I'm breaking open a new spot, I'm concentrated on how well that's going to drain, um, which makes the difference in how I'm going to, if I'm going to set up raised beds or not. Um, and so generally speaking, the, the, you know, just generally speaking, uh, get a soil test, kind of get an idea for what your soil, what kind of soil type you're working with. Um, get a good idea for your, uh, soil organic matter. If you have really low soil organic matter, uh, that may be something you'd want to address because that's ultimately is going to help with your crops down the line is to just go ahead and get, if you're going to do any sort of tillage in the beginning or any sort of plowing, get some good compost down. Just if you're going to make that one really harsh, you know, uh, you know, act on your soil, make it worth it. Put some good compost down, get some good nutrients down there, kind of get an idea of if your soil has any grave deficiencies, maybe like if you have no, I don't know, um, something that's a little bit more stable. Like if you're, if your magnesium calcium is really out of whack or something, talk to an agronomist and maybe they could be like, well, put a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You don't have to do everything. Um, if it's there, your plants will generally be able to accept, access it. But if you have any grave deficiencies, maybe address those. Um, and then I like having raised beds in the situation where I'm having poor drainage. On my other farm, they actually were kind of not helpful because I had such good drainage. So um, knowing what your drainage is, I think is really important. Do that little drainage test. Um, and you can see a video of that online too. There's videos online of doing drainage tests, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of it. And then, you know, uh, if I don't want to plow, then I'll tarp it for a while or mow it really heavily, put some cardboard down some compost and let that sit for, you know, over the winter time. Um, and then in terms of establishing the like living pathways, I just, like I said, you know, it's usually a blank slate and then I'll put some cover, I'll put some clovers and stuff down that I want and then over time, after mowing and stuff, nature kind of takes over, decides what's there. So, um, yeah, I think that, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, and we have uh, Dan, who is, you can go ahead and unmute Dan and ask your question. Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Uh, 
AJC, uh, uh, huge follower of your um, art. And so my question is, I have a barn filled with decades old hay and straw, and, I, and we want to get it out of there for kind of repair the barn. Like, should I? Uh, we're talking like, God, you know, hundreds of yards. I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing you, Dan. I think what you're asking is you have hundreds of bales. Straw. And I have about 14 acres of land, and I'm debating pilot to use as mulch. Like, what would you do if you had this, knowing that it's not necessarily? I have a barn filled with hundreds. Um, if I need to get it out of the barn, if that makes sense. Okay, so uh, you broke up a little bit, but I think the question was that you had hundreds of bales of straw and hay kind of tucked into a barn that were really old, decades old. Yeah. Um, and, and you wanted to know what to do with that. Is that correct? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would just use that as like a, my carbonaceous mulch for composts. You could use it as a mulch. I mean, it may be hard to deal with if it's that old. It may have like fungal issues and be kind of rotten together. Um, but generally speaking, like I would use that as there's nothing wrong with it. It's not going to be as nutritious. Like it will have dehydrated and a lot of those nutri nutrients will be gone, but it's good carbon. Um, you know, you could probably use that as a... Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, in your compost and those sorts of things. I'm going to doubt that if there was any chemical residue, for instance, on there, that it's still there. Um, even, you know, if this, especially if it's decades old, they weren't using a lot of that necessarily on hay. Um, but yeah, I would, I would maybe compost it, add it to compost, add it with some nitrogenous material. Um, and, or you could use it as a mulch if it, if it makes sense. Um, you know, depending on how hard it is to move it, like how hard it is to actually deal with the material. Um, yeah, I hope that's helpful, Dan. Yeah, thank you. Great. I'm going to do one plug and then we'll go to full hand forms with the question. Um, so save the date for March 3rd through the 5th, 2023. Hopefully we will actually be in Hendricks County together in person. Um, and I have this last slide here about our civil rights and justice for all pledge and um, join us again Monday for the vegetable session where Jesse's coming back to talk about intercropping and Tuesday we have pollination but if people are available we can stick around for a few more minutes and answer a couple more questions if you don't mind Jesse. Oh I'm happy to do it. Okay so full hand farm Eli if that's you go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Uh, there we go. Yeah, I think I'm unmuted. Yep, you're good. Okay. Hi, Jesse. Hey, I had a question. Uh, we've been putting compost down for, I don't know, five or six years and have been starting to see more lettuce drop or that white mm -hmm. mold that's the business. And wondering if you've run into that at your old farm or your new farms or have any thoughts as to whether those, so like higher organic matter could be tied to that or any thoughts Eli is that uh, well and it's nice to see you Eli I know your farm um are you is that um is that in your tunnels it's in your fields as well uh I guess it's more more tunnels and more in the winter okay yeah we Summer, uh, we've gotten Central it. India. yeah We've gotten, um, so we've got lettuce drop this year. I never had an issue with it before, really. Like we would occasionally get it, but I never had outbreaks. I had an outbreak this year um, in yeah. some of our romaine uh, towards the end of like, uh, towards the beginning of February or end of January. Um, so that was kind of unfortunate. Uh, it's really, my understanding of lettuce leaf drop is it's generally, yeah, it's, 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 um, you know, uh, a ventilation thing, but I don't know. I mean, maybe there is something to that. And Eli, are you all planting directly into the compost? Or are you working it in a little bit? Uh, oh, no, I am still unmuted. I thought I was muted again. Uh, it is uh -huh. directly into the yeah, compost on the top and then planting into it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I've um, played around with by the year we're applying the compost, right? So as to whether we're doing it in the spring, let the summer crops ride out on it and then not reapplying for the fall to see if that's helped and then vice versa vice versa bringing in fresh in the fall and letting that ride out not reapplying in the spring and seeing mm. how that's and it it, it ha, I, I'm, I'm using content as a control so it's not completely gotten rid of it um 
but it hasn't taken over everything. I'm still getting lettuce, um, but I am seeing it kind of move around the farm. So just wondering if you'd run into it. Yeah, that's that it, I I've had it. Um, I'm curious to see how it will do this upcoming fall, uh, this upcoming winter. Um, because we never really had a big issue with it on our old farm, but we do on this new farm. And I kind of wonder, uh, if it's a matter of the ventilation that we have on our new property, um, uh, well, in our new, in our new tunnel and, uh, also the compaction issues and the drainage issues, cause it's the drainage issue. Actually, we get some standing water in that tunnel, not necessarily where the lettuce was, but it was very humid in there in the winter time too. So that was kind of a combination of things. Um, I don't know. I'd be curious to know how that goes if it, if it gets worse or if there's, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's a tough, it's a tough disease. I, I, um, maybe I should do some more research on that one. Probably all of us. Yeah. So I wish that was more helpful, Eli. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay. Tyler, Tyler Keenan has asked, do you use any farm generated amendments like compost teas or fermented plant juices? Oh yeah. I love that stuff. Uh, we use, uh, we do a lot of, I'm, my preference as opposed to a lot of the fermented juices and a lot of the Jadam stuff or the Korean natural farming stuff is to just run everything I need through the compost pile. Um, Brian O'Hara does that too. And I really like that. It just, it simplifies things for me. If I need or want a certain nutrient, I'm more likely to add it to the compost that I'm going to be applying to that area. Uh, and then use it as a tea. Maybe, um, I do like, I don't like teas as much as I like extracts and slurries. Uh, I teas kind of worry me sometimes that you're, um, uh, when you brew something overnight, uh, for 24, 36 hours that you're risking brewing, organisms that you don't necessarily want to be spreading out. I feel like with a complex compost, um, your risk of, of, of propagating the wrong organisms is very low with a compost extract. So one of the things I do highly recommend, and I say this a lot, is to get like a bag, like a, they call them like a micron bags or compost tea bags or whatever you, you can find them online. They're just, they're, they have very small holes, so they don't allow the material to get through. So you can use it in a sprayer. Um, I take what I do before I start uh, actually, oh, I don't have my screen up anymore, but the, um, what I do is I take a bottom watering tray before we plant anything and I'll take a really nice compost and I'll get that in some, in some like, uh, room temperature water. And I'll just get that really nice, that bag full with a, like, you know, pound of something of compost. Um, I'll get that really saturated and I'll squeeze that bag and that pressure. Actually, I've seen it in a microscope. Um, that pressure actually releases a lot of both microbes and the, you know, all the things that you want out of it, some nutrients, but also like the, um, auto inducers, the, the, um, chemical signals that microbes pass back and forth that tell that it, it's about quorum sensing. It's maybe too much to get into now, but those are good. Those are really important. That just tells the other organisms in the soil what who's there and what's going on. So anyway, squeezing that bag um, is really important. And I do that and I basically take a water, bottom watering tray. I fill it with water. I squeeze that compost bag in there. I set the tray that I'm going to be planting in that. That tray sucks up that moisture. And then I take that out to the field. To me, like if you can do as much inoculating in your greenhouse as you possibly can, it just simplifies the whole thing. Like I do some foliar sprays and stuff like that. I try and minimize that because it's just wasted work. Like it's a lot of, it's not waste, like it's good for your plants and it's good for your soil, um, but it's not harvesting and planting, right? Those are the things that as professional growers, we do need to be focusing our energies on those. So I'm also lazy. I just, that that's just the, 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 the easiest system I came up with with getting my fields inoculated was let's do it in the greenhouse because that's where all the plants are. It's um, efficient, not lazy, efficient. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Amy Serberg had one comment in here. I think it was about the lettuce drop. Uh, she says, oh, I've been seeing it too, planted directly into compost in the spring last year. I wondered if maybe the inoculum came from my potting mix. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know enough about the life cycle. That's like kind of my question. Um, I'm not, this year was the first year that I was ever like, oh, I need to learn more about it because it had never been a big issue for us. Um, it could, that sounds like something that, yeah, it could live on your compost. It, you know, maybe it's something that's just surviving in the soil over the winter. So yeah, I, I wish I knew more about it to, to be able to be more helpful. And, but I have incentive now to learn more about it. So maybe by next year, I'll have yeah. more info for you. For our Indiana people, Dan Eagle. Yeah 
send Danny Eagle a message. He's our pathologist. Oh, good. Um, so I'm not seeing any more questions and you have given us some extra time. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I hope that you went in and you filled out that survey, post survey for the session. And join us again on Monday to hear more from Jesse um, and then some of our local farmers here in Indiana. Yeah, thank you all so much. Thank you uh, for, for coming. And yeah, join us on Monday. That'll be super fun.